big thanks to West Pharmaceutical for supporting us. And then our supporting sponsors, Daiichi Senko, Merck, and Eli Lilly for um, being side by side with us as we continue to discover topics relevant to our community and listen to you for ideas on new conversations and new areas of interest moving forward. As always, if anyone has thoughts or ideas for topics they'd like to see in the future, as always, please let us know. Yeah, you absolutely can email us or even pop it in the chat as well. And we do a mm -hmm. survey too. So we do get a lot of our inspiration from all of you, our community for sure. Um, I'll review just the, uh, the perspectives that we will be sharing with you this evening about the discussion around alcohol and breast cancer. Uh, so we will be taking the science perspective to kick us off this evening. So um, we have one of our physicians from Mount Sinai who will be discussing and really explaining the science aspect of it. I'll be doing a little bit of discussion from a nutrition perspective um, to share a little bit of background in setting the stage about alcohol consumption, what that means, again, in terms of nutrition. And then we'll be addressing it also from the behavioral aspect and sort of looking at it as a societal behavior um, and also leaving with some strategies. If uh, consuming less alcohol is something that is a goal of yours, uh, we will be leaving you um, with some tips to hopefully help you moving forward. All of our presentations, again, will be available on our HER library. So you're welcome to review those slides uh, as well as rewatch the video. Perfect. More tools for that toolbox, Erin, right? Absolutely. You yeah. can't go wrong. Yeah. All right. I think we should get started. Perfect. All right. I will start with introducing Dr. Sarah Cade, if you want to put her uh, front and center. Dr. Cade is the lead physician for the Special Surveillance Breast Program at Mount Sinai at Beth Israel. She focuses on increased risk patients, as well as breast cancer and benign breast disease. She specializes in BRCA-positive patients and other patients with genetic mutations, as well as prophylactic mastectomies. Dr. Kate is involved in several research projects and has presented her research at the national level on top topics such as vitamin D and breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, DCIS oncotype, and tumor markers in early breast stage breast cancer. Dr. Kate, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. So just give me one second. Can everyone see my slides? You guys are good? Okay. Yeah, you uh, got so it. Thank, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I'll just be talking a bit tonight about the science behind alcohol and breast cancer. Um, so I don't have any financial disclosures, meaning I don't have any relationships with drug companies or anything like that. Um, just, to, you know, a disclosure that I can't really offer a comment on anyone's medical course just because I don't have access to your chart and I'm not the treating physician. Um, so please uh, don't direct any personal questions to me while I wish, of course, I could help you and answer all those questions. I just simply cannot because I'm not privy to all the details of your care. Um, so alcohol, uh, alcohol and breast cancer to start. So we know that breast cancer affects 2 million women per year, and that's the global number. And we know that one in eight women will be affected in the United States, which is obviously a very uh, large number. Um, and so to think about the connection between alcohol and breast cancer, um, as a physician and as a scientist, it seems kind of odd that we only started thinking about it in 1987, but that's really when the awareness about it was raised and it was in one of our big medical journals. Um, and it did show that there was an increase in risk in terms of breast cancer. Um, from alcohol and what it's what we consider a moderate risk factor. So it's not like a BRCA or genetic mutation for breast cancer, but it's somewhere in the middle in terms of risk. Um, so the World Cancer Research Fund showed that uh, there was a 5% increase in risk for women with alcohol use when they were premenopausal and then a 9% increase for postmenopausal women. And they showed that with 10 grams of alcohol per day, and of note, a standard drink is 14 grams. So we really uh, will get more into this later in the panel, but um, it's commonly misconstrued how much alcohol is in a drink, what is a drink and all of that. And that's not my topic to discuss, but of course, very interesting. Um, there was no difference in location um, in terms of, uh, there was a difference in location, excuse me, there was no increase in risk for Europe and Asia, but the risk was uh, persisted in North America. 
Um, alcohol is one of those things that's hard to study. So patients always ask about diet, and Aaron will talk a bit about this um, in terms of what's the best diet for cancer. So that's a common question we get every single day when talking to patients with breast cancer. Um, but nutritional studies are hard to do because patients who can't put them in a hotel for six to 12 months and wash everything that they're eating and monitor all of that. So the same applies to alcohol studies. It's very difficult because we're relying on patients to report how much and patients don't measure how much they're drinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so people often are very surprised by this when we talk about it in the office. So they'll say, you know, obviously wine is okay. And I say, you know, when all the studies have been done, hard liquor is the same as beer is the same as wine. So that's a common, common misconception. Um, and of course, part of our goal tonight is to dispel some of these misconceptions. So there was one study that showed out of a group of 360,000 European women, there was a stronger association with breast cancer with ER positive tumors. So breast cancers get tested for estrogen, progesterone, and something called HER2. And this showed that estrogen-driven tumors had a stronger association with alcohol. Um, but there are other studies that have shown that there's an increasing risk of all types of breast cancer. So HER2 positive, triple negative, these are some of the buzzwords that we talk about. Um, and in terms of animal models, we've seen that when you expose pregnant um, rodents to alcohol, there was a higher rate of cancer overall in the offspring of those rodents. So that's an interesting concept. Um, so alcohol does increase breast density, and we know that breast density is a risk factor for breast cancer, especially if you retain that density after menopause. So density is a function of the amount of breast tissue seen on mammography. Um, and so we know that alcohol works to increase that density where we want the density to be decreasing over time to decrease our risk of breast cancer. It does affect folate metabolism, which has been studied in the lab. Um, and one study interestingly found a lower risk in people that drank more when they supplemented their folate. Um, but obviously not a medical recommendation to compensate for heavy drinking. Um, but people that drink lightly, they didn't find a difference when you supplemented with folate. Um, and just some of the science is that the oxidation from when alcohol get metabolized, it goes through stress and uh, basically makes a free radical and that leads to DNA damage. So alcohol is metabolized to acid aldehyde, which is a known carcinogen and it affects the DNA, like I said. It increases estrogens in the body, and the majority of breast cancer that we see is driven by estrogen. Um, and so there have been studies that have shown that, like I said earlier, that public awareness of alcohol uh, leading to cancer is very low. Um, so there was a study that was done of almost 4,000 patients that um, under a third of them knew that alcohol was associated with cancer at all. Um, and only 20% of those thought wine was a problem. So 80% of the general public is thinking that wine is okay. And uh, we know from, you know, various social media sources, sources right there, you know, talking about wine o'clock and, oh, I'm going home to have a drink and that's normal. And it's very normalized, I think, especially in Manhattan where I practice. Um, that drinking is okay and it doesn't lead to any sort of issue where people kind of think about cutting back is actually related to weight. And it's, I've never heard someone say, oh, do I need to stop drinking because I'm not, I now have breast cancer. Um, so it's really important to get that awareness out there. Uh, so the American Cancer Society came out a couple of years ago and they said no amount of alcohol is safe when it comes to any cancers. Um, and we definitely know that for breast cancer, one drink per day increases the risk of breast cancer. Um, but once someone has breast cancer, there's various different factors that lead to a breast cancer diagnosis. It's never completely due to alcohol, right? So there's certain exposures to estrogen, people that get their period early in life, people that go through menopause later, people that have family history, people that have a genetic reason for breast cancer. So there's always eight or nine different factors leading to breast cancer, but alcohol is one of the things we can control. And a lot of those things we can't control, right? You can't control when you get your period, you can't control when you go through menopause, you can't control your family history, you can't control a genetic mutation. So I always talk to patients, let's take control of what we can take control of now and say weight and alcohol are two of those things. Um, 
definitely we do not recommend any consumption if you're actively getting chemotherapy because of course chemotherapy is primarily metabolized through the liver and uh, alcohol is as well. So that's something just to discuss with the treating physician team that you have if you're about to start a chemo regimen to please uh, discuss various supplements and alcohol with them. Um, and these are just some of the references that will be up on the website. And I tend to speak quickly. So if anyone has any questions, um, I'm available. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kate. All well thought out, even though it was quick, it was, you know, a presentation that was right to the point. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Tracy Wolf did have one question. Uh, she was asking, is there a difference in risk for initial diagnosis versus a recurrence? Um, it's a good question. I think um, we don't necessarily have so much data on that. There's varying studies about that in terms of risk of recurrence and then risk of death from alcohol. Um, and I would say that people do better, obviously, without drinking. That's the general gist of uh, most of those studies. Again, they're all retrospective. They're not prospective. So people don't get randomized to one group and say, you know, they had a stage three breast cancer and they get randomized to drinking and not drinking. So we have to take all these studies with a grain of salt, but I would say, um, I think it's a lifestyle change that needs to happen once you're diagnosed with any sort of cancer. Um, someone else had a question, why do I think oncologists don't discuss this with patients? I think in general, there's so many topics we have to cover when we see a patient. So as a breast surgeon, you know, I, I see the patient first and we're talking about neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we're talking about radiation, we're talking about anti-estrogen treatment, we're talking about surgery. There's just a lot to cover. So I think, you know, someone like Erin is an excellent resource. So most patients that are seen at a cancer center do have an opportunity to meet with a uh, nutritionist. But again, that's just one more thing to do. And so when patients are diagnosed, it's horribly, horribly, horribly overwhelming. Um, and so I think that's where it kind of falls through the cracks. So I think it's just, you know, it's difficult to time all these things and get it into a console. The chat actually um, lit up with quite a lot of questions too. I so see. we'll help, we'll help you out here. Okay. Um, one was talking about, you know, what about, how about MBC? How about, you know, alcohol with MBC, I guess is her question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it depends obviously where the metastatic sites are. So if you have a high burden of disease in the liver, definitely, you know, would discourage drinking. But I think um, it's one of those things where I tell patients, you know, that, you know, if you're pregnant, right, patients in Europe drink and may or may not affect the baby. But uh, if you can stop drinking for nine months, I think that's good for the baby, right? Because we know that a small amount of alcohol can be metabolized differently by different people. So um, I, I would say, you know, that if we're talking about metastatic breast cancer where patients are living longer, there are benefits to stopping drinking completely. And then one here um, was talking about, you mentioned metabolized in the liver. Does that include tamoxifen? Because we know that our, a lot of our women are on that for, yeah, for five, yeah. 10 years. So tamoxifen is metabolized by the liver. It's not really the same intensity as chemo. Um, but again, it's sort of one of those things that we're talking about controlling whatever risk factors we can for recurrence and for progression of disease. So uh, we definitely do talk to patients at Sinai about not drinking. Um, as much or cutting back, you know, like the zero tolerance approach is hard for patients. Um, and so definitely cutting back. And I think like also measuring amounts that you're drinking and seeing, you know, like people will say like, oh, I go through a bottle of wine in two nights, like that's a lot of alcohol. Yeah, I know Aaron's going to touch on those amounts as well, because everybody has a little a different um, variation of what a glass is, right? Um I also saw that, you know, Karen was asking about genetic testing, if it could show if there's a predisposition to alcohol and a cancer lake. Do you have anything on that? Genetic testing? No, I'm not aware of that. Uh, there was one study that was done in BRCA carriers and saying, 
was there increased re risk of breast cancer in BRCA carriers? And of course, they didn't find an increased risk. But I think a BRCA carrier is like the opposite end of the spectrum, and only five to ten percent of genetic of breast cancers are genetic. So I really think that's just like such a subspecialized population. Okay. I think some of the other ones, Aaron, we're going to be discussing in your presentation and Dr. Siegel's as well. Um, just the amount of drinks, you know, a lot of, a lot of chat asking, you know, what is the amount three drinks per week? Um, yep. And I think and, what uh, Dr. Siegel will address also, we're getting a lot of questions about, should I have none? I was told no more. How, what do we look like? Those sort of behavioral aspects we'll cover um, with our last presentation tonight. So hopefully that will provide some insight in terms of, you know, what's the best decision for you. And then I think I'll do this one question to Dr. Kate. It, is, is it the sugar in the alcohol that is the problem? What about other foods? Uh, so it's a great question. You know, sugar in general is, is definitely a big topic of research now. We know that weight in breast cancer increases recurrence. So people with an elevated BMI have higher rates of recurrence. Um, and so it's not necessarily the sugar in alcohol, it's just the fact that it's a lot of empty calories and that it leads to weight gain. So that's one component, but we really think it's that fact that it's metabolized to a carcinogen is the problem with the cancer risk. Okay. And can you repeat that? I know we had a question early on, um, maybe before I hop into my presentation. Can you repeat the name of what the alcohol is metabolized into? Yes, um, acid aldehyde. Thank you. Maybe we can pop that in the chat, Dr. Kate, just so people sure. can see the spelling of that as well, and it might register a little bit better. No problem. And then we have a couple questions just about some of the therapies and the agents that some of our community is on. Are both the Rumidex and Virginio metabolized in the liver? Uh, Virginio is one of the newer medications, so I'm not. 100% sure, but the majority of breast cancer drugs are metabolized in the liver, so Nasrital is also. Um, so yes, Fresenio, I would have to like quickly look up, but I believe so. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Kate, I'm going to ask if you might want to just look at the chat, you know, while we bring on Aaron, if there's any more that you want to add to the chat, because we do save it. So that way it can be a nice, you know, um, uh, area where they can get the facts from you directly. That would be fantastic. And thank you for that. I know we had a, a, quite a bit come in there fast and furious and we appreciate it. Good. All right, I am going to move over and I am going to um, have Erin come up next. And everyone knows Erin, Erin, our co-host here tonight. She is our uh, director of our nutrition and culinary program. Um, you're gonna be cooking with her all the time and getting your nutrition consults. But Erin, this is a question that we get almost daily daily. And I know you and your team do have this as a part of just what you re recommend, you know, just so that it's approachable. So I'm going to let you share your screen now and I'll let you take it away on a nutrition, um, you know, area of alcohol and breast cancer. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yep. So uh, I will be covering the nutrition aspect of it and really looking to set the stage for Dr. Siegel moving on, but hopefully to answer some questions just about what is a standard drink, what goes into it, touch a little bit on the nutritional um, effects from regular alcohol consumption. So um, what I will be, just sort of a quick agenda, I'll be reviewing what is a standard drink, the difference between alcohol by volume and proof of alcohol. We often hear those two numbers the caloric density of alcoholic beverages. I will discuss what actually is moderation, um, why that moderation recommendation is different for males and females. And then again, we'll touch on alcohol and the um, diseases associated with it, as well as its effect on vitamin absorption. So to start us off, what is a standard drink? So you heard uh, first and foremost in Dr. Kate's uh, discussion, um, a standard drink is also known as one drink equivalent, which contains on average 12 grams of pure alcohol. That is what is considered a standard drink. Now, Dr. Kate mentioned some of those studies that she reported on, there was an increased wit risk uh, with drinks or uh, grams of alcohol starting at 10 grams. So now we're already seeing a lower baseline compared to what's considered a standard drink. So um, 
in the US, a standard drink in volume is a 12 ounce serving of beer at about 5% alcohol by volume, five ounces of wine at about 12% alcohol by volume, or one and a half ounce of a distilled liquor at about 40% alcohol by volume. Now, we've seen that the ABVs can vary different, can be very different depending on the type of particular, the brand, the distilling method. So we see those percentages change, all of which change the amount, the grams of alcohol in a given drink. Could you calculate if you really wanted to know how many grams of pure alcohol are in a given beverage that you are consuming? Absolutely, there is an equation out there, uh, which I'm more than happy to share with you. However, what I find to be really helpful um, is a calculator online, which I will share in the chat from, um, there's a link from nutritionheart.com that I find. But if you're really curious, there's an easy way to just plug in. If you want to dive into, you know, what this beverage that I'm having, this beer that I'm having, um, that's got 12% alcohol in it, how many grams of pure alcohol does that equate to? I think it's very eye-opening. Um, and, and something that may be a practice that we should do at least once to get, a, to get a little bit of a realization. So more examples of a standard drink. Again, we looked at 12 ounces of a regular beer, 5%, um, 8 to 10 ounces of a malt liquor or a flavored malt beverage. We went over the wine. Uh, that volume falls a little bit for something like a fortified wine, 2 to 3 ounces with a cordial and aperitif. Um, one and a half ounces, the distilled liquor. So these are more examples of what we consider, again, that standard drink, which is 14 grams of pure alcohol. As that number changes, those volumes will change as well, which is confusing in general, which is why nobody knows, you know, what's a good recommendation. Hopefully we help you with that. Let's touch a little bit on alcohol by volume versus proof and what they mean. So alcohol by volume, ABV, is that percentage that we hear on a bottle, right? It measures the amount of alcohol in a bottle compared to the total liquid versus proof, which is used to describe the potency, okay? Proof is only used in distilled liquor, so we don't see wine that says it's this amount of proof or beer with this amount of proof. Um, it's really those just distilled liquors, tequila, gin, bourbon, all of those. Um, and it's also used to denote taxes for a distiller. And a quick way to determine if you know what the ABV is, um, if you double it, times it by two, you get what that proof is, right? So 15% alcohol times two means 30 proof. And again, we see some examples on the right of what they are in general. So you see their numbers like the liqueurs can vary greatly. Beers can vary greatly. Wine can vary greatly. So let's talk calories in our alcoholic beverages. So many of us know the calories associated per gram of our other macronutrients, four calories per gram of carbohydrate, four calories per gram of protein, nine grams per calorie of fat. Each gram of alcohol provides seven calories. Now you might do a little bit of math and you're like, well, you know, 14 times 12 isn't, isn't what it adds up to be, or, you know, um, you know, where are the discrepancies in the total numbers? It's also some other things that go into a particular beverage, other sugars or carbohydrates that aren't necessarily fermented into alcohol, they still provide added calories. When we're adding mixers or simple syrups or carbonated things, all of which uh, adds additional calories. And again, if there is a really wonderful online link that I'm happy to share in the chat, that again, um, is an easy tool that we can use to assess like how many calories are coming from my alcoholic beverages. These activities aren't things that we need to do all the time. It isn't something that we need to have on our phone all the time. But similar to when we connect with our participants and we talk about food journaling, it's not something you need to do, but periodically maybe checking in with yourself and saying, 
gosh, how much am I really consuming? How much is it really contributing? Um, these little check-ins using tools like this can be very, very insightful. Again, I will share these links in the chat and they'll be available in my presentation in the library. So then what exactly is drinking in moderation? So per the USDA and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, drinking in moderation is no more than one to two drinks a day for men, no more than one drink a day for women. Uh, what is considered heavy drinking is for men more than 14 drinks a week and or more than four drinks in one day, women more than seven drinks in a week or three in one day. And then binge drinking is considered five plus drinks in two hours. So a large quantity in a small period of time. And then for men, I'm sorry, for women is four or more drinks in a two hour time. So just to put into perspective where we start to move to those heavier intake categories. So what's the deal? Why, when we look at these overall guidelines, again, these are not guidelines provided by the World Cancer Fund, or I'll talk about what our recommendation is at Unite for Her, taking into consideration um, all of the data and science that we know. But what's the difference between, you know, why are men able to have, um, you know, their daily recommendation is more than women? It really comes down to total water content within a human body. It doesn't have so much to do with just body size. So alcohol dissolves more readily in water than fat. Men on average having bigger bodies, um, they also have smaller percentages of fat, which means their total water content in their body is greater, meaning they can tolerate more alcohol, so to speak. Um, the second piece of this is also alcohol metabolism, right? So we heard um, a little bit about the breakdown from Dr. Kate, but the initial first pass of alcohol metabolism actually starts in the stomach. So the liver primarily produces the enzyme ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase, that breaks down alcohol. It's also produced in the stomach. However, women produce less of this gastric ADH compared to men. So when women consume alcohol, less is being initially broken down, meaning more alcohol is getting into the intestine, in turn getting into the bloodstream, in turn getting to the liver. And that is where the difference in recommendations comes from. So alcohol and disease risk, of course, we're here to talk about um, breast cancer and disease risk overall, but I think it's really important to note that um, regular alcohol consumption is related to a lot of different health diseases overall. It can affect cardiac health, neurologic impacts, um, especially when we talk about certain vitamins like our B vitamins, lung health. Um, gastrointestinal, bone, pancreas. So there's a lot of long-term issues that can arise with heavy, consistent alcohol consumption. One thing I do like to call out is also the cancer connection. And this is something that, again, we share quite regularly with our participants is the link between six different cancers. And an interesting part of this is the cancers that we see here, liver, colon, breast, um, the oral cavity, so the pharynx, larynx, esophageal, rectum, um, most of these, if not all of them, travel along the GI tract. And so we know that when alcohol is broken down into that carcinogen and it changes DNA of cells, as that alcohol passes, um, part of the theory is that it could be uh, affecting the DNA along that GI tract. So that's one idea in terms of why a lot of those particular cancers are affected and why that link is there. In terms of vitamin absorption, alcohol intake, you know, impacts our vitamins overall. 
B vitamins are usually the ones that are called out at the top of the list because B vitamins are used in the process to metabolize alcohol, thereby not allowing them to be available for other processes within the body. So um, thiamine B1, alcohol, uh, consistent alcohol consumption is the leading cause of deficiency among adults whenever we see a thiamine deficiency. Um, it's usually something that we try to um, assess if we were seeing a patient. Um, B6, alcohol interferes with the conversion of B6 to a usable form, as well as that carcinogen that alcohol is broken into, accelerates the destruction of vitamin B6, also affecting it. B12 and folate, um, reported in up to 80% of alcoholics have a folate deficiency. Um, zinc is also affected. Chronic alcohol abuse is associated with lower serum levels, and it also impairs zinc absorption. And vitamin C is affected. Um, regular alcohol use is associated with an increased excretion of vitamin C. So um, just to share a little bit again on the nutritional impact and to really set the stage for Dr. Siegel, one thing that I do want to reiterate and, uh, and I myself have talked with a lot of our participants about this, we are often questioned about um, you know, what is Unite for Her's recommendation in terms of alcohol consumption. So our, our stance on this is, if you choose to consume alcohol at all, and hopefully this discussion will you know, assure you that there are lots of other avenues and mocktails and other things that you can enjoy, um, no more than two to three servings per week, per week and not all at once. So that is our stance taking in all of the science that we know and um, you know, our general discussion. Um, so if anyone is curious, I know there have been some questions about recommendations and what's a normal amount. That's, that's usually what we will tell our participants when that question is posed to us. But again, the mocktail revolution is strong these days and we do a lot of mocktail recipes ourselves. We've got plenty on our blog. Hopefully that is an inspiration to you. Thank you, Erin. That was fantastic. I did love how you talked about how it follows the GI track. I, I never connected all of those. And I think it's so valuable um, to really just have that perspective, you know, that visualization um, for us, because we know a lot of disease and 90% or higher comes from our digestive or our GI track. So it all lines up there. Erin, I did put nutritionheart.com in the uh, chat. I'm not sure if you wanted to also put in the um, alcohol in the heart. If you want yep. me to pop that one in, I'll share those two specific, uh, the two specific links that I shared in my presentation, one to calculate the grams of alcohol in a particular beverage yeah. once that proof is changed and then um, the calories. So both of those I'll pop in once we start with Dr. Siegel. Yeah. Fantastic. Such valuable information. I love that you were talking about just check in, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to keep a journal. You don't have to do anything like that, but it is good to check in and see where you stand because then you'll have information that can just give you an idea of how you want to move forward. And really you, you're the only one that knows, right? Like nobody else knows how much you yeah. are consuming, you know? Yep. So, so just being tooled, that's what today's presentation is all about is giving you as many tools as possible. Absolutely. So we have a couple questions, Aaron, if you, um, look over at the chat. One is, is there a preference of red wine over a hard alcohol? No. No. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. I know that a lot of, um, you know, the, uh, the Italians, the French, they drink red wine and all of those concepts that just feel like it's okay for them. Right. And, and we, and we tend to think it's healthy, you know? Right. Right. And, and I will say, um, in, in, so again, my own research as a dietitian and posed this question quite a bit, you know, the resveratrol discussion comes up. And again, I, I know, I believe Dr. Siegel will touch on this as well. Um, but okay. Red wine has resveratrol in it. Um, to get the benefit of resveratrol, that antioxidant benefit, we'd have to drink a lot more than five ounces of red wine and you will be much better off getting that uh, nutrient from other sources naturally. Um, so I think, you know, oftentimes we use that as a uh, something to lean on as a reason, but 
um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, I don't consider that a valid reason, so to speak. It's definitely there, but you know, we'd have to be drinking a lot more to, to potentially get a benefit from a spiritual. And then we fall into, we've just over, we've over, um, you know, we've exceeded our recommended volume at that point. Yeah. I thought it was important too, Aaron, that you did touch on people say that, you know, can I actually take all of my drinks and have them in one night? And you did touch on that is not combined. It's one drink. Right. And and that is something that, you know, just getting that knowledge. Um, Same thing about organic wine. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing about organic wine. I know it's very trendy. There's a lot of marketing, uh, you know, really compelling about organic and clean. But when it comes down to it, we're really looking at the alcohol. Right. And that breakdown of of alcohol within the body that that is the point of concern. Uh, Dr. Kate mentioned there are other things in that discussion, um, but uh, it's that it's the alcohol. Yeah. Uh, Patricia had talked and touched on, and you talked about this as well. There are so many non-alcoholic beers and drinks and different types of, you know, um, new products popping up that are really very interesting and make you feel like you're social. So I know I feel like this is a great segue into Dr. Siegel because he's going to give us that behavioral, you know, uh, aspect of why we choose to drink and maybe some good tools. I know some good tools to help us there. Absolutely. Okay. Aaron, um, I'll let you, let you take it from here. Yeah. Thank you. It is truly my pleasure to introduce Dr. Siegel this evening and I will bring him on screen. So um, Scott Siegel is a licensed psychologist who specializes in working with people affected by cancer. Dr. Siegel is the director of population health research at the Helen F. Graham Cancer Center and Research Institute, part of the Christiana Care Health System in Delaware. In his role, he conducts research and develops programs to target the leading modifiable causes of cancer. Dr. Siegel, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Erin. And uh, I'll just go ahead and share. And hopefully, is this uh, coming through okay? It is, yeah. Okay, great. So um, it's uh, great to be here with everybody. Delighted to speak with you about this topic, which I spent a lot of my time on, and it's also really great to follow after two wonderful presentations that provides a lot of the background. So, as was noted, I'm going to speak more about the behavioral side of this. I'm a psychologist by background. I do, um, I used to do primarily clinical work. I do more research these days, but I really enjoy talking about um, the influences on behavior and how that affects cancer outcomes and health more generally. So, Dr. Siegel, I'm going yeah. to just jump in half of your screen. I didn't know if it was the first slide or if you pop to the next one, but part of your slide is cut off. It says alcohol end, and I, we're just seeing the H. Can you just check your next slide? Yeah, let me, um, let me try this again. Yeah. So, that one's great. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I had a second monitor attached, which I think was goofing it up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So what we've heard so far uh, from Dr. Kate is, you know, the science of alcohol and health. This is going back now to the 80s, and we've only accumulated more evidence since then. We've learned more about how to define alcohol quantities. It's not how much you can fit in a glass or a cup, but, you know, there's more specific measurements we want to keep in mind and, and some recommendations on alcohol use. And after hearing all that, you might be feeling a little bit like this because, some of the more recent reporting on alcohol and cancer and health may be contrary to what you've heard previously or what you've believed. And it's my hope that today I can help us all to make better sense of what we've heard, Um, maybe even process some of the feelings you're having, uh, which may be related to feeling like this is conflicting with what you've been told before or by what other people continue to tell you. And that if you are in the position where you're interested in cutting down on your alcohol use, Um, you know, I can recommend some strategies that are based on the evidence to help you along that way. So for a lot of people, alcohol is a very important part of their life and saying goodbye to alcohol or even just cutting down can feel like a loss. So I thought I might discuss this in terms of the five stages of grief. 
I should just acknowledge, though, that our thinking on grief and bereavement has evolved quite a bit since uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross first presented the five stages, but this is something that a lot of people are familiar with, and I thought it could be a useful tool for kind of describing the different things that I've heard and have been reported on among people who are learning about the health effects of alcohol and what that might imply in terms of their own use. So just to remind you, or if you haven't heard this before, the five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and hopefully ultimately acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would just sort of take us through each of these stages and, and relate some of what we've learned. So from a denial standpoint, or as I would actually prefer to call it healthy skepticism, if you learn something that's completely new, it has significant consequences for you, and it's contrary to what you've known before, it's only healthy to have a little skepticism about what you're hearing and to ask questions and to not necessarily just treat what others are telling you as fact. So it's good to question what we're hearing. But some of the things that often come up for people, and maybe you're thinking of this, or you've you've thought this recently, is that, uh, you know, I thought alcohol in moderation was actually healthy for you. Now I'm learning it's not healthy. It's actually may even hurt you. Um, or that, you know, scientists keep shifting around on what is and what isn't healthy. And, you know, what's healthy today, tomorrow isn't, and vice versa. And, you know, a lot of people point out eggs. How many times have we been told it's good for you, it's not good for you, it's cholesterol? No, there's good things in it. Um, I actually, on a grant submission to the National Cancer Institute, received this feedback. Uh, it was a grant that I submitted with some colleagues on alcohol and breast cancer. And we, you know, we, from a scientist trained to review grants, said, well, people in France drink wine all the time and they're fine, healthier even. Um, so it shows you that it doesn't matter what your education level is. This is such an ingrained belief about alcohol. Turns out that the people in France actually have a lot of alcohol attributable illness. You don't always hear about that. We'll get into that in a moment. And then there's this more sort of fatalistic attitude. Something's going to get you one of these days. So, you know, I might as well do what I enjoy. Um, these are all very common reactions and you may identify them in yourself. Or as one of my favorite uh, philosophers says, it's not denial. I'm just selective about the reality I accept. Um, a lot of this belief that alcohol and maybe even wine specifically is good for us goes way back to the 1990s when Morally Safer did a story on 60 Minutes called The French Paradox. Some of you may even recall watching that. This was a very pivotal moment in media. There's been research on just how this new story then led to an increase, a really rather significant increase in wine consumption in this country. And the gist of that story was that in France, where there is the consumption of high fat foods, the use of cheese and butter frequently in their diet, um, that despite the high fat consumption, their heart health outcomes were much better than what we saw in our own country. And that there was speculation that there was this health protective effect of wine and maybe more specifically red wine. And this got a lot of attention. Um, the uh, US vineyards are very thankful for this story. And it's wrong. And we have a lot of good science since then to show that it's wrong. But why is it wrong? Well, one of my favorite quotes about correlation is that one of the first things you learn in an introductory statistics textbook is that correlation is not causation. Just because two things go hand in hand doesn't mean that one causes the other. It's this idea that correlation is not causation is also one of the first things forgotten. So the fact that you might see people who are consuming more wine in better health, you can't necessarily infer that the wine is contributing to better health. The other quote that I think that's relevant here is from George Bernard Shaw, who said, the moment we wanna believe something, we suddenly see all the arguments for it and become blind to the arguments against it. So when someone says wine is healthy for you, we all of a sudden lose our skepticism if that's something we very much wanna hear and believe. But it turns out that there's um, people who drink wine may engage in other health protecting behaviors and have other protective factors going for them. Um, and like I said, in France, there's actually been quite a problem with alcohol attributed illness, uh, so much so that the French government has taken pretty drastic action to try to reduce the average consumption of alcohol in their country. And once the media made 
this statement, the alcohol industry itself ran with it. Um, they purposely misled the public for many years about the, oh, and still do actually, about the supposed health benefits of alcohol. This is a study that looked at um, communications from different alcohol companies. And I highlighted a few key words in here, but you can actually see the word denial is highlighted that the alcohol industry has been more than complicit, but they've actually gone right up to the edge of saying things that um, are inaccurate and false advertising. So they have a huge budget. They spread the word um, quite rapidly. And if we're all quite receptive to hearing that alcohol is good for us, it, it you know, we become co-conspirators in that. Doesn't hurt either that the alcohol industry has really, I'd say, co-opted some of the symbols and messages from the cancer advocacy world. You can, I just have a few pictures here of how different uh, brands have put the pink ribbon um, on their packaging, um, sometimes saying that they'll donate a certain amount of their proceeds to, to charity. There, There is no law or regulation or requirement that putting a ribbon on your package means that you're actually contributing to a cause. There's no oversight of this. It's not a copyrighted thing. There's no licensing fee. But also, I just find it a bit galling that if we know that alcohol is a leading risk factor for breast cancer to then start trying to align yourself with breast cancer advocacy and awareness. So the takeaway here on this sort of denial or healthy skepticism stage of grief is that if you previously thought alcohol is good for you in moderation, you're not alone, you have a lot of company and it's not by accident, but we now know better. And we already heard the evidence, I'm not gonna get into this, but we have very high quality evidence now to show that there is no healthy level of alcohol use. And that's both in terms of breast cancer and just your health overall. Some have thought that, well, maybe it caused risk for breast cancer, but it was heart protective and, and even that the evidence is pretty clear is not the case. So we're beyond, you know, as we move through the stages of grief and we're moving beyond denial, a common next reaction is anger. And, you know, a lot of people have the reaction that, um, you know, they're quite upset at the suggestion that you want me to give up this one thing that I really enjoy, this one glass of wine a day. Are you telling me that's really gonna hurt me? Or I'm tired of people telling me what to do or the nanny state. And one of my favorite quotes is, it's the patriarchy, not alcohol, that's killing us. And, you know, um, it's probably both, to be honest, but certainly alcohol is not good for us. So questions to consider if you are having maybe not outright anger, but maybe even a little bit of irritation or discomfort at the thought that, hmm, maybe I should cut down, but I'm not too happy about that. One common reason why people develop anger is because they feel like someone's imposing something on you, telling you what to do. And what I would like you to take away from tonight's session, if, if nothing else, is that none of us here is really happy to tell anybody what to do. What we're trying to do is share good quality information so that you can make the best decisions for yourself. And to really take this away and say, how can I best focus on my own self-care? And it's not about, you know, um, responding to anyone's request or demand. But if you focus on your self-care, do you find that the anger maybe shifts a little bit? The other reason why sometimes people become angry in reaction to feeling uh, of having to live without something or something less like alcohol is that it's just too hard to think about living without it. It's not worth it. Um, the idea of giving this up is just something that it's too important to you that you really don't want to. And you're kind of feeling like, you just want to assert yourself here. And if that is also something you're feeling, that's important to attend to. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I'd like you to, if either of those reactions are occurring for you, I'd like you to ask yourself uh, and maybe even reflect on it after this session, but what purpose, what important purpose perhaps does alcohol serve for you? For a lot of people, their answers are something like, well, it helps me to relax. Or if I've had a stressful day, that glass of wine really sure does calm me down. Some people really just truly enjoy uh, the beverage, its appreciation of its multiple layers and the different types and the years and all that. And I get that there's a real, you know, uh, it's an, a real craft to produce wine and there's a lot to appreciate about it. And I don't take anything away from that. Um, for others, it's a social lubricant. It's, it helps them to have a good time when with others. 
for others still, it's beyond a social lubricant. It's the one way that they know to really let loose, to really truly enjoy themselves. Alcohol helps them get there. And then finally, I put peer pressure here in quotes. I think most of us are long past the days of junior high school or high school where we're trying to do things to keep our friends happy with us. But if you acknowledge the fact that there are so many social norms in our society around drinking, that to be at a cocktail party or some social gathering and not have a drink in your hand, how many times are people going to offer you a drink? Or how many people are going to look at you funny if you don't have a drink? Or at least that's our perception in a lot of cases. Um, and there's just, it's not an outright mocking or teasing like might happen in adolescence, but there are all these subtle cues to push us to drink. And so sometimes we'll, we would be just fine without one, but we're sort of just going with the crowd. So the takeaways on anger is, you know, really attend to that feeling. I'm not telling you to not feel that way. I'd actually like you to delve into that and try to understand it better and consider what purpose alcohol serves for you. Maybe it serves multiple purposes. Bargaining. Um, a lot of people feel like, well, if I'm healthy in every other way, but have some alcohol in my life, that's okay. And of course, you know, this is not an all or nothing proposition. The more ways you can be healthy, great. But that doesn't cancel out the effects of alcohol. Um, some people say, well, I only drink as a reward for whatever, but it turns out whatever that reward is, it's it's maybe a bit more frequent than would be recommended. This came up a lot tonight. You know, well, what if it's red wine and not liquor? Is that not so bad for me? Or it's organic. And maybe there's all other ways in which these products can be made better for the environment, for the people who are producing them. Maybe there's less sugar, but still there's that alcohol in there. And no matter how you process it, if there's alcohol in it, it carries a risk. For some people, um, abstaining 100% from alcohol is the right choice. It completely eliminates the risk of alcohol and it really just makes decision-making easier. They, whenever offered decline, they don't have to think if this falls within their budget for the week. For other people, limiting the amount they drink is the right choice. They acknowledge that there's a little bit of risk, but they're willing to accept that. However, just be mindful of the fact that it does leave the door open to bargaining with oneself where you may say going into the week, this is the maximum I'm willing to drink, but before you know it, it's one holiday party after another, and you're at double or triple or quadruple what you wanted to, and you know, right back to where we started. <laughs> A great quote for this is in terms of you know the bargaining and, and the moderation challenges is one martini is all right, two is too many, but three is not enough. So takeaway on bargaining is abstinence is a good option for many, but things don't have to be all or nothing um, either. And if you do wanna take more of that moderation route and follow the recommendations of two to three drinks per week, but not all at once, just be aware of how that could quickly turn into more than that. And finally, depression, why do I go to a party if I'm not going to drink? It won't be any fun. This is a common thing I hear. Or it's hard for me to think about life without alcohol or less alcohol. And some people do think that without alcohol, when I'm at social gatherings, people won't like me very much. Alcohol is what makes me fun to be around. So either alcohol is good for making other people fun or it's good for making you fun. And I would just, again, say, pay attention to these. These are important feelings. Um, we're not going to solve them in an hour, but the things to sort of put a pin in and think about more later. And what I would just encourage you to do is remember that alcohol is not the source of your fun, but maybe it's a shortcut to getting you there a little quicker. And can you think of times in your life where you felt good about yourself and had fun with others when alcohol wasn't present? Now, um, you don't need alcohol to have fun. And if you believe you do, this is probably worth exploring. So the takeaway on this is Alcohol is not the source of fun. For some, it's a, it's a a shortcut. And to really try to ponder the true sources of joy in your life. So I've created a very quick acceptance checklist, things that I hope you can walk away with from tonight. And do you understand the evidence on alcohol and health? And you have to do your own self-assessment. And one's here to do this for you. But do you think reducing your alcohol consumption could help your health? And if so, you should probably ask the question of yourself, what does alcohol do for me? Because unless you address those purposes that it fills, it's really hard to make a lasting change. How else could I meet my needs with less alcohol? Uh, I'll provide a few slides on that in a, in a minute. And what could my social life look like with less alcohol? So I, I'm noticing the time um, and I'm not gonna be able to really uh, dive into each of these, but you'll have these slides 
to review after the fact. I've just given you a bunch of different strategies for dealing with the different purposes alcohol serves for many. For relaxation, I know it sounds a little too simple, but a few deep breaths, even five deep breaths um, can do a lot for your physiological arousal. And you'd be surprised if it, instead of immediately turning for a glass of wine, you do that first, that maybe you're pretty good. You're as relaxed as you need to be. Physical activity, if it's not a part of your life, we know it does great things for anxiety and relaxation. I love the idea of building transitions into a day. Too often we go from one high pressure situation to another hectic situation to another. And a lot of times alcohol is helping us to transition into a slower paced part of our day. So thinking about building that into your schedule and scheduling time for you, because um, if you're going to take away something that brings you comfort and happiness, you know, what else can you schedule in for yourself? They mentioned uh, mocktails and non-alcoholic drinks. They really have come a very long way. If you just truly enjoy the taste of alcohol or whatever beverage, you know, think about that. They have come a very long way or other non-mocktail drinks like some people really develop an appreciation for different types of tea and, and so forth. In terms of social lubricants, um, this is a more complicated topic. Um, but, you know, take a look at this at a later time. You may get some ideas for how to feel more relaxed in social settings. Uh, ideas for letting loose, too. I think it's important to have um, opportunities in our life to really not be so inhibited. Uh, but you certainly don't need alcohol to do that. I've listed a few things. And uh, for dealing with peer pressure and placebo drinking, which I don't define here, just means if you're going to be at a social event where you expect people are going to encourage you to have a drink, have a drink in your hand. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic drink, but you have that drink in your hand and people leave you be. Um, sometimes you wanna just have conversations with key people in advance, let them know that you're not gonna drink and you would uh, appreciate it if they respected that. And in some settings where you feel comfortable, you know, you might share that you have chosen to cut back and the reasons why, and you never know, you just might inspire somebody to also make changes. So with that, I say thank you. And um, I realize it's exactly seven o'clock, but I'm, if time allows, I am certainly happy to stick around for a few to answer any questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. We absolutely want you to stick around for a couple more questions. So if you have to leave, we will continue to have this uh, recorded and we will share the chat. But if you can hang on, we have quite a few in the chat. All right, let's get started. So Erin, I'll start with Corinne's question. She said, you know, question for any of the presenters, is there any data that shows if women of different races or ethnicities have different increased risk with alcohol consumption? I, I'll just jump in real quick because this is actually that grant that I mentioned that we submitted uh, was on this topic specifically. Um, there's not a lot of evidence, but there is enough to suggest that there are certain groups who given the same amount of alcohol experience worse outcomes. And in particular, Black or African-American women, this seems to be the case and it may carry additional risk. We need to do a lot more research to understand what that is. Um, is, is it um, the combination with other exposures pot potentially? Is it possible gene by environmental effects? We're not sure, but yeah. So th there is evidence of that and that it may be contributing to disparities in breast cancer. Dr. Kate, do you want to jump in at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I completely agree with um, what Dr. Siegel said, that definitely in Black women, there are studies that have shown worse outcomes. And I agree, it's probably multifactorial, but it is one piece of the puzzle. Um, and again, difficult to study and more research needs to be done. So I applaud that effort. Thank you. Um, some, of the, some of the questions were just sort of around our cooking and our baking with alcohol, wine, rum, elderflower, liqueur, um, extracts like vanilla. Uh, what are your thoughts there, which all have alcohol? I think most of it is burnt off um, by the type of cooking that's done. It's not, you know, it's not the same as like the idea of a mold wine where that's cooked um, at a very low temperature. But if you're baking something at 325 or 350, degrees in an oven, most of the alcohol is burnt off. So I think that's fine. Um, and most of us are not consuming like that type of like, you know, food every day. But again, it goes back to weight and Aaron can weigh in on that too. So definitely, you know, baked goods are not good every day. And I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a struggle for all of us, right? Like we want to eat carbohydrates and we want to drink wine, but the 
and we have to control all of that. Erin, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. I um, second what Dr. Kate said. Uh, I'm looking at it more of a perspective of overall consumption, and it's such a small quantity. Number one, you know, yes, most of it is going to be burn off, if not all of it, but little bits of vanilla, a teaspoon, you know, a little bit of white wine and cooking and making a sauce. Um, it's such a small volume. It's not something I would think that is we're working with so regularly every day that we would then be concerned about a risk. Thank you. Erin, can I ask you, what about kombucha? You know how we make our own kombucha and I, I hear that there's alcohol in that. Um, there, so there is a, a very, very, very little bit of alcohol naturally fermented in the process of making kombucha. But again, it's such a small amount um, that, okay. I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see that as a huge risk. Okay. I guess that also sort of goes to the question Jocelyn posed yeah. to some of the non-alcoholic beers, like some of the ginger beers or alcohol-free mm -hmm. where it's 0.5% ABV. Um, again, I, you know, these are an upgrade in terms of overall quality. Uh, the overall volume, you know, is so small that the risk is, is really negligible. Thank you, Erin. Um, we're really getting a lot of love in the chat, just thanking all three of you for this presentation. It's very informative. I've learned so much. Um, it's very timely, as we know, with our holiday parties and open bars. So we appreciate all of you here tonight, just giving us some facts. We can go home. We have tools. I love the questions and the checklist, Dr. Siegel. Um, I am happy to say that when I looked at that checklist, it definitely was something I enjoyed. I do with my family. And then when I looked at your other checklist, it was something that I felt like I understood completely the effects and, and really brought that to light as well. And that I could, you know, absolutely bring it out of my life to have fun and enjoyment and revert back to those times when I did. Um, let me see if there's anything else here before we call it um, an evening. A lot of thank yous. Erin, did you see anything else while we were in there? I do love that. I do love the idea of the teas. I do think that warming that that feeling of ritual happens too with alcohol and tea and coffee tend to be a ritual, at least I know for a lot of our community, myself included. So it is creating rituals and transitions. And I just think the three different perspectives have given us so much that we can take home and, and try and incorporate into our own lives. There is not one magic bullet. We say this all the time with integrative care and how we even treat side effects and symptoms. It's, it's not going to be just one thing that's going to like make your side effect go away. It's a combination, right? It's a combination that works for you. And that's where we're here to meet you where you are. Okay. Just scrolling one more time. Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone. Yeah. Erin, I, I would love to share our screen one more time to thank our sponsors. We are so grateful for our presenting sponsor, West, and then also our education sponsor, Daiichi Sayanko, GSK, Merck, Seagen, and Lily. And they have been with us all year. We have very, very thoughtful subjects, topics, and this being one of them. And, you know, you can rely on us to bring these incredible speakers. Erin is on our team and just is such a wealth of knowledge in the field of nutrition, oncology and nutrition. And then to bring in our partners, you know, from Christiana and Mount Sinai as well. It, it's so valuable to us. So we, we appreciate you uh, both for being here. Erin, um, anything else you want to say to take us off? I, a couple things. I will be sharing um, some mocktail recipes in the blog, I'll, but we have plenty on our blog at uniteforher.org. So please go check them out. There's lots of cookbooks that you can buy with mocktails. And like Dr. Siegel said, um, it, it has been taken to a whole new level. So you can really get creative. They can be delicious and beautiful. So um, I really encourage you to embrace that as well. Um, one final reminder that uh, we have our Ask the Experts again tomorrow, streaming live on Facebook, no registration, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, maybe a good follow-up to how we're feeling this evening to look at mindfulness-based stress reduction. Mm -hmm. So chatting with our partners from Jefferson at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health. So really excited to have them. That will round out our year for our digital education oh. events. So hopefully we will see you tomorrow. And um, yeah, with that, I also just want to share my, my thanks, Dr. Kate, 
Dr. Siegel for sharing and giving us some things to think about. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully, just as you said, this gives us information so that we can sort of do a little bit of assessment and come to a decision that we find is best for us. So this is all about information sharing and teaching. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll meet you where you are, you know, and give you those tools one step at a time, but rest assured, we're going to give you the facts. And that's what today did. So um, very appreciative to the panel, Aaron, fantastic. And uh, thank you both for joining us, Dr. Siegel and Dr. Cates, and just have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful holiday, and absolutely get on our blog for mocktails. Aaron does incredible ones, and they are um, beautiful, and you'll be holding that glass, and it just might be a little bit easier than you think. Yeah. yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all. You have Bye. a good day. Thank you so much. You too.